uh, thanks for joining. It's, I'm really excited to be here presenting part of my research and the work we do with event data, trying to try to extract team style or certain parts of team style. A uh, little bit of myself, um, I'm a computer science, my background is in computer science, and after working a while in health analytics, I pursued my PhD in the German Sports University of Cologne, where we basically work into the intersection between information systems and big data methodologies uh, applied to sports and sports technology, of course. So uh, let's start by introducing what I mean with team style and why do we think event data is such a nice resource for that. So let me start by questioning, can we define team style? Uh, well, from a very theoretical point of view, we can assume that in a football game or in any team sports game, uh, the two teams that are playing actually have a system or a strategy in place. And a match is basically a clash between those two systems. Um, actually, in the media, um, sometimes this team style concept is presented very aesthetically, so how the team looks like. Uh, but in some data-driven resources, as we can see here, uh, we see how uh, we can find, for instance, this 2D allocation of Premier League uh, teams. In this case, I think this is grouping by passes per sequence and also direct speed uh, generated. And sometimes I wonder whether this is team style or is actually the consequence of team style. So depending on how a team is playing, is generating those actual metrics. If we look at the research, because I'm coming from the academia, so let's look at a little bit on the research. We find that in 2016, uh, team style was defined as the characteristic playing pattern demonstrated by a team during games. And I think a very important term here is the pattern, which suggests you know, recurrency that's happening more than once. And this is very useful for, for instance, scouting. So we want to know exactly what was the role of a certain player um, in, in an overall team style, or also, of course, in opponent analysis. So we want to kind of contextualize the certain opponent, how, how they're playing. Um, so answering the question, uh, defining team style is actually very challenging um, because there's a lot of different situations during a football game. Uh, teams might be looking for certain specific goals in that moment, so it's, it's challenging. Teams might be also changing how they're playing depending on the opponent. And overall, the set of possibilities that a team can actually perform in the field is almost infinite. It's not like chess where you can actually computationally foresee pretty much the possible uh, outcomes and replies from the opponent. So in this project, we wanted to provide a bit of an end-to-end -end methodology where, first of all, we kind of isolate the context so we know exactly what we want to study. Second, we provide a logic, how, how it can extract team style from that certain context. And finally, but, but is also really important for us, is how we can communicate that to, to sport sta stakeholders. So that's a bit the overall introduction. And we're using event data uh, for that because we think it's a really nice and precise reconstruction of, of the game. And I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the different usage that we can find with event data. We can create custom metrics, or we can also train probabilistic classifiers. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of us, we are aware of how um, different metrics like expected uh, goals, expected threats are created. So we basically chain the events into a sequence, and we try to predict the next state. And that's a bit of a summary, but it's more complex than that. And, but we also know that through this sequence, what we can do is also sequence modeling and try to identify patterns out of this sequence. Probably one of the most known uh, visualizations for, for pattern matching is the uh, passing network, where we can see a little bit the usage of the players in the field and also a little bit the collaborative uh, patterns. Maybe something not that known is the flow motives. So I really recommend you this paper uh, down here from people from the Netherlands, where they're trying to get frequent uh, a set of sequences that are happening inside uh, a game. So based in those two models, what we wanted to do is a sequence modeling of event data, where assuming what I started this, this talk uh, saying, that there's a system or a strategy in place when teams are, are playing, I, we believe that event data is the best footprint or trace of, of this system. So in a bit of an opt optimistic analogy, so we're looking at event data, the footprint of the system, and we want to know which system is running on top. And for that, we used a methodology that we extracted from other sectors, like manufacturing or healthcare, and it's called process mining, um, where we basically map the sequences that are happening in a match to the processes that are happening in a system. And a process is basically defined as a set of activities that accomplish a certain specific goal. And process mining is nothing else than a set of tools and algorithms that allows us to discover the underlying system from a set of event logs, in this case, 
our event data is our event logs from a certain real world uh, system. So we want to know what is running, which business is running inside a certain event data in terms of what's happening, who's doing, and when, where that's, that's actually uh, happening. So let's dive into this process discovery. The first learning we found is that, of course, there's no such a thing as a process for a single game. Uh, if you look into a single game, there's too many, as I introduced, there's too many different situations. Teams change uh, uh, goals or uh, micro goals. So sometimes you might want to you know, like stabilize the, the possession or you might want to create a counterattack, etc. So what we first need to do, and I'm pretty sure that's probably day-to-day -day life for a lot of analysts and data scientists, is segmenting the game in different possessions where a team has the ball. So then you can actually see the different possessions. Uh, and you, here you'll already see quite a bit the variability between the possessions. So every possession has different spatial uh, allocation and also different goals that the teams are trying to achieve. So what we do then is what we call uh, um, applying a purpose of study. So you really need to know your research question or your, your question in general. So what, what exactly do you want to study? So I'm going to be using this running example on I want to analyze how a certain team is able from their own field, from their own half of the, of the field, how it's able to um, access the, the opponent penalty box. So if you do that and you filter the sequences for those sequences that are able to do this goal, uh, you still see a lot of variability, but you start seeing some kind of pattern, some, something that is recurrent on how a team is performing this task. And finally, we also apply a simplification step that is also based in different approaches. Some of them were presented here last year where we create a field partitioning. So we are able to um, identify similar sequences, not by the exact coordinates of the actions, but more uh, for the um, zones that are traversing in the, in the field. So overall, this is the pre-processing pipeline that we're doing um, to the process discovery. And we end up what we so-called uh, team purpose traces. And those are the traces or sequences that are, we're feeding into the process miner. And the process miner is a data mining algorithm that doesn't want to predict a metric or create an expected uh, metric, but rather wants to create an explanation, a logical model that tries to explain how a certain team is performing the goal that we're looking for. So we're looking at a certain logical model. And I added more detail on the manuscript attached to this talk, but we're basically using a combination of a heuristic and a fuzzy miner, uh, which basically they are, there's, those are two examples that work pretty good on natural flows, so uh, flows in reality that they don't follow a specific structure or a theoretical structure. So I think uh, the chaotic um, behavior in football is quite a match for, for these algorithms. And how does the outcome of this process miner look like? So uh, what, we, what we can extract from a process miner, as I said, is a logical model. And a logical model can be represented as a uh, state graph where we have the different states of the game and the transitions. And I added this example in particular um, just to show how difficult it is to model football behavior. So this is the state model, uh, state graph, or heuristic network, as they also call it in the process mining um, community. Um, every node of this graph that you see here is basically a certain action happening in a certain zone of the field. But you can see this is called the spaghetti model in the process mining community. Uh, you pretty, pretty much you can guess why. Um, and it's very complex to analyze it, but if you really if you would zoom on it, you could actually analyze. You see the start of the sequences is top there, the end of the sequences is um, down there. And if you would zoom at the different actions, you could actually identify several decision-making points. So you see actions that are happening, happening close to the midfield. So they're trying to you know, like build up the possession. And then actions that are happening close to the penalty area, which maybe is the decision-making uh, you know, close to the end of the goal. But as you're probably guessing, this is quite a mess to present to you know, stakeholders, in the, especially in the sector of sports. So what we also work into is uh, how to translate these logical models into something that is more uh, likely for, for a, a football visual, let's say. What we created is this heuristic flows, um, which is basically a one-to-one -one translation of the heuristic network we uh, saw before. Um, in the left, you see a heuristic map of a single match. Um, in this case, we have different encodings. So we first encoded the color of the field zone as the likelihood of that zone to be the start or the end of a certain uh, model. Um, then we also have the zone dependencies that are telling us how much correlated are different zones in, in terms of the flow of the team traversing those zones. 
And then you also have the zone usage, which is this uh, white bubbles, quite similar to the passing networks, that indicate the frequency that the team is using these zones in particular for the task we are, we are studying. And for instance, for this single match, you see that at least that certain team, in general, tried to use a bit the left lane to try to access the penalty box. And on the right side, you see uh, the same team, but the behavior we used for the process mining is all the season, all the performance during the whole season. And in this case, you see that there's a lot more uh, behavior because we have more matches, of course, but still some of the recruitment patterns we can see on the whole season are also present on the, on the singular match. And that's a bit what we did. So after all these explanations, let's see some use cases. So I'm gonna start with this running example. So we really wanted to know how Premier League teams last season from their own uh, half, they were able to access the penalty box. So I brought some examples here. So you can see here Manchester City, Arsenal, and United. Um, you can still see that it's quite, the visuals are quite noisy and we're really fighting with the dependency thresholds of the model. Um, that also means that the spaghetti effect is also present in, in these visuals, it's not a problem. Uh, but we can see actually some uh, interesting uh, insights. So first of all, we can analyze the midfield. You see that teams like uh, City and Arsenal actually try to, you know, approach the midfield right from the middle. You can see it on the zone uh, usage that are more prominent, also Arsenal as well. Um, City then is quite homogeneous on accessing the last third, but Arsenal really tries to go to the, you know, right or left um, uh, sides, especially the left. Uh, on the other side, if you look at United, they actually show quite different patterns. So they approach the midfield quite also homogeneously on the width of the, of the field. And then they either try to go vertical or use these uh, horizontal lines on the last uh, third. So I also brought, just for fun, also Liverpool, which is quite a different uh, model as well. So again, they really use the whole width of the field to try to cross the midfield. And then they either like to try to go vertical on the lanes, or they also have this kind of wavy transition to the right, to the left, uh, in terms of um, um, direct speed to the offensive. Um, what is actually interesting now is that if we assume that we are correctly capturing certain team style on these models, we can go back to every match and try to evaluate how much this match was following the overall season uh, model. So we basically can get to every match and see, is this match something that the overall season model actually observed or it was something noisy that we didn't, we didn't use for the overall model? And what we can come up with is a bit of a proxy for a team regularity or consistency in playing in the same way. And interestingly, we saw that City, teams like City, Arsenal, and Liverpool, while they play differently, they actually showed quite consistent patterns. So they, they are regular on how they achieve this goal in particular. And while other teams like United or Tottenham as well, they are more uh, irregular in playing um, a certain pattern. And I wanna emphasize that this is not a success metric at all, it just means how consistent teams are executing certain uh, action in this goal, which remember this was how they were accessing the penalty, the penalty area. I brought a quick, uh, another example. So we also can model how teams are actually having turnovers, how they lose the ball. So I did a really small experiment where I said I want sequences that actually happen in my own half or a little bit on the opponent half that end up with a turnover. Um, so we can see differences like that. So in the case of City, you see that there's no actual pattern on how the turnovers are happening in this case. You see a little bit of tendency to the right side in the first uh, part of the, of the visual, while Liverpool uh, heuristic flow suggests that the turnovers are happening when the ball is not able to transition to one on the other side. As you can see that the two, let's say, vertical halves of the field are isolated. There's no dependencies between them. So that, that can give us uh, some insights. Okay, so just wrapping up. Um, so we saw how we can use process discovery techniques to identify certain team style uh, components. And we also translate it to football visuals so we can get it more ready for, for analysts. Um, I wanna also emphasize that this is a high uh, customizable uh, component. So we can change the goal of study and we can also change the field partitioning, that's why in the very near future, we're working on how to apply different field partitions so that those might be more close to how certain teams are actually approaching uh, the, their you know, set of guidelines and, and principles for, for playing. So that might also bring really cool, cool stuff to, to this project. 
Um, finally, as, as extensions or, or limitations, we are also aware that we need to incorporate a lot of the other state-of-the-art uh, sports analytic methods to, to this. So for, exa for example, I would love to also differentiate by the game phases, so kind of differentiate the sequences by the game phases, or also which formations are actually matching up. So that really, it's a, it's a huge component in, the te in terms of why teams are playing in a certain way. Uh, finally, what we also work into it is how to add the 360 information to these uh, models. So we did it only with, with basic uh, event data. And so far we have two options, but I would love also to hear uh, your feedback in that because we can also use some other approaches that just build a secondary uh, state space and we try to you know, use both of them for the mining of the logical model. Or what is also interesting and maybe more uh, feasible in the short term is we can analyze the different uh, zone dependencies by the distribution of the opponents and understand why there's a higher dependency towards a certain zone or, or, or another zone, depending on how the opponents are, are located. So that would be all. That's the references for, for the talk, and I'm looking, really looking forward to your feedback. Hey, Mark, thank you so much for your presentation. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed your, your research. One of the questions that I have is that, what do you see as the implications and the challenges of doing this kind of approach live and mid-game? What do you see that, what are some challenges and some opportunities to address them? Um, well, in terms of challenges, probably the first one I would say is the data availability, right, on, on, on mid of the game. But I, if, if the club or the organization has the, the resources to have it, I think it's, it's, really, it's really useful. Um, there's actually a really nice opportunity on that that we didn't investigate too much because we don't have the resources for that. But if you would actually know how the team should do the task, like the theoretical part, right? So if you're working within a club and you actually know how the overall guideline on how to penetrate like the penalty area is, you could create those logical models beforehand um, and try then to observe, like, so you create a logical model that we would call the theoretical model. That's just basically your, your football insight. So your football knowledge says your team needs to do this task this way, using the field, whatever. And then you can compare that to the observed model. So you can run these models and compare, kind of, you know, overlap those two models. And I think this is very interesting because then you can, you know, check conformance. You can check whether there's deviations from your theory to the observed one, and that's what you should tackle. Why? why we're not doing it as I am kind of ruling, right? That would be an opportunity. Thank you. Can we thank Mark again, please? So thank you very much. Thank you.